jump into where we started last week. If you weren't here last week, um, what we started to talk about is, is what can I expect from the Word of God? And we only got to two points of seven. So I actually made it through the other five for a service, so I think we're going to be good, okay? Uh, because I want to get this to you because i got something else I want to I be able to share next week. And last week what we talked about was what can I expect from the Word of God? Expectations can be a dangerous thing in some relationships. But the Word of God is very clear. It says from the Word of God you can expect, number one I gave you last week, was that you can expect a renewed life. Number two, I said that you can what you can expect from the Word of God is you can expect it to reveal truth. And so we just hung out in those two areas right there. Because if you don't know that God can renew your life, and if you don't understand that the Word of God is going to speak truth each and every time, we, we, we need to start there. Now, we're going to pick up where we kind of left off. And what I can expect from the Word of God. In relationships, I can put expectations on other people. People can put expectations on me. And that can be very frustrating at times. You expect your husband's going to put away that laundry. You expect your wife's going to cook dinner every night. You expect, you expect, you expect. And I don't want to give too many examples because people start to get uncomfortable like, did somebody tell you something? <laughs> and let me, let me preface before I get too far into this too. After first service, I had two people come and say, were you, were you speaking to me? I mean, like, did you know something that I didn't know you knew and so you were saying? I know nothing, okay? Like Sergeant Schultz off Hogan's Heroes. I know nothing. You know that show that dates you right there. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit knows something. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit knows everything. And if He wants to reveal something to you, it's because He's trusting you. That He wants to bring some healing, health, some wholeness. So, once again, if your toes get stepped on, I didn't do it. Technically. <laughs> The Word of God, what can I expect? I can expect from the Word of God that, number one, I'm going to have renewed life. Number two, it's going to reveal truth. And then number three, I want you to write this down. What you can expect from the Word of God is that it is going to illuminate your path. The Word of God will illuminate your path. I love how clear the Bible is when it talks about the lamp and the light, God's Word being light to us and the way that it goes before us. The, the crazy thing is, is even though his word is truth and his word illuminates our path, don't you find it funny that many times we feel free to take a, 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 like a field trip? You know, God says, here's the path I have for you. Here's the direction to go. And we say, I'm going to try something different. You ever do that with God? All of a sudden, you became the Christopher Columbus of your life. You want to go discover a new world. You want to go see what else is out there. And I remember when I was young, I did that. I grew up in a Christian home. I know what it means to read the Bible, go to church, Jesus, relationship. But yet at some point in my life, I wanted to go off and do my own thing, only to find out I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. See, there's times when we, we, we can get off track. One of the things you can always count on, though, is that the Word of God is always, always going to illuminate the path that the Lord is revealing to you. If you find yourself in a dark place, sometimes what I do is the first thing I ask is, Lord, am I on the wrong path? Hey, have, have, I, have I taken a detour, and is there something I need to know? But you'll find that God's Word will always illuminate your path. It's always going to, to reveal truth to you. You know, one of the things that the enemy wants to take away from you and me, by the way, it says in the Bible that, uh, John chapter 10, 10, you know, that God came to give life and life more abundantly, but prior, right before that, it says what? The enemy comes to do three things. Steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. His vision, the enemy's vision, is to steal, kill, and destroy, but... God came to give life and give it more abundantly. Or some translations say, give it to the fullest. God's word is always going to illuminate your path. The enemy's plans are always going to be to, to take away your vision. He wants to take away your vision. Uh, a man without vision, the Bible says, what happens to them? Do you remember? Yeah, they perish. Uh, if you don't have vision, you perish. And, and I've shared before with you, but it's been a while. Maybe there's new people and. Uh, I served for the Clinton County Sheriff's Office. I had served a while, a while ago, being a chaplain. And one of the things that they were going to do is they said, we want, you know, they're doing all this, uh, here, you get a badge, you get this shirt, you get a belt. And I thought, oh, cool, man. I was feeling like Barney Fife. You know, I got my bullet and everything. They said, no, no, no bullets. I said, all right. I said, we want you to carry mace. And I thought, it's pretty cool. You get to carry a can of mace. 
you know, I'm feeling pretty bad right about now. I start strutting a little bit. You know, and they said, no, 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 you don't understand. you gotta, you got to go through training for mace. And I'm like, how hard can that be? It's like hairspray, right? I put hairspray on every day. Psh, you know, aim and spray. That's all you have to do. They said, you still don't quite get this. We're going to test you on mace because there's some responsibilities that come along with this. Okay, how hard is it going to be to pass a test and spray a can of mace? And he said, not hard for us at all, because we're going to mace you in the face. And I said, hold, hold, hold on a minute. <laughs> Everything changed right now, right? And I said, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know about that. Uh, they said, well, you know what? If you're going to carry mace, you have to understand the effects of it. Long story short, they, they were going to take me out behind the, the police department, spray me in the face, and watch me squirm, I guess. And uh, but they wanted me to learn the responsibilities or understand the effects that it has. I get that. I completely do. But I had a problem with the whole, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I, I don't get paid to do this. I'm volunteering. You're going to mace me in the face? I said, so I started talking to God about this because, you know, nobody else was going to sympathize with me. And uh, so I said, God, I understand. You know, I said, I would volunteer my time, give my time. You show me one scripture in the Bible that shows me I, su I should subject myself to this. And I'll shut my mouth and get maced in the face. And don't pull that crucifixion stuff. Because, you know, that trumps everything, right? And I, I didn't want to. I, I, I kept looking at the Bible. I kept asking people. Nobody had nothing. I thought I had God on the rails on this one. I really did. And an hour before I got, I was to go down and get maced. I was leaving the church. One of the staff members said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going down to get maced. And I told him this, the, I told him the story, you know. And I said, I told him, give me one Bible verse that shows me I should do this. And. God didn't give me anything. Without missing a beat, they said, oh, I became all things to all people that I might win a few. And I said, shut up. <laughs> and I walked out of the church, <laughs> went down there, and I got maced in the face. Here's what I found that was very interesting when I went through that process. The way that stuff is designed is intentional about taking away your vision. Right? Now, I'm not going to ask if anyone here has been maced in the face because we don't really want to raise our hands to all of that. But the reality is, is we understand the purpose of that is to take away your vision for a period of time so that you can be distracted and not get to where it is you want to go, but where whoever it is that makes you wants you to go, right? It's exactly what the enemy does. He comes along and wants to take away your vision so that you can't see what direction you need to go. You get frustrated, irritated, you get angry, mad, you don't know what to do, you feel you're in despair, you're going through loneliness. And the enemy jumps on that. And he wants to take away your vision so that all of a sudden you can't see your left from your right, your up from your down, and he wants to try to maneuver you. The enemy will do that every time. I find it ironic we're coming out of the year 2019, heading into what year? 2020. My prayer for you and me at the end of this service will be simply this. That as we enter into a 2020 year, and not to just play off of the words, but that God will give us a 2020 vision where we've seen the enemy steal from us, that he steal no longer, but we understand what it means because we know what to expect from the Word of God. One of those things is this. It will illuminate our path. I, 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 uh, we would go over to a cabin in Amboy. Uh, my kids are older now, 21 and 18. I don't know where the heck the time went. But when they were younger, we'd go over there a lot more, and we'd walk the trails. And my kids are, I was going to say they're weird, but they're very much like me. So... Um, so they are weird. They like to hike late at night. And I love that. You know, it's kind of spooky and kind of scooby doo ish We'll go out there. And the rule has always been that I'm going to tell you a story about what's going to happen. There's so many paths. If you get scared, you can tap out. We'll go back to the, to the, to the cabin. And so we were heading down Scotty Plum Trail. Now, Scotty Plum Trail is a trip. All these trails, by the way, are made up. But don't tell anybody else that because I use the stories all the time. But Scotty Plum, you know, I take him down at night. We walk down a path, and I know down around the corner, there's a wind turbine with a red light flashing. They don't know this yet. So I use that opportunity to tell a story about the Dixon Prison that's only a few miles away. And you know there's always a problem with the Dixon Prison because the red lights will flash. And I know that in a few moments, they round that corner, they're going to see that, they're going to be scared. You know, I'm not trying to just spook my kids, but we just, they, we're telling stories, and and have you ever told a story so good you started to believe your own story? <laughs> That's where I'm going with this. I have a flashlight. I'm walking the path, and I'm telling them about Scotty Plum. To this day, they don't know where Scotty's at. Fifty guards went in after him. Only 30 came back out. I mean, I'm telling this story so good. Half of my brain's going, get out of here. Run, Jim. Run. 
you know, and I, I got my little flashlight, and we had some friends with us, Reed and Missy. And, and as we were walking down the trail, Reed found, thought this would be a great opportunity as I'm at the apex of my story and scaring my own self to throw a, a limb over to my right side. And as soon as he did that, I about wet my pants. I shined that light over there, and I truly became Barney Fife. I became so scared I had believed my own story. I was so thankful for the little light I had. But at that moment, I wanted everything lit up. You know what I mean? How many of you have ever gone through dark situations? And you can laugh at a story like that, but how many of you have gone through dark situations in your life where it feels like, you know, all the darkness and the heaviness is just, it's just uh, hovering above you and all you got is this teeny tiny little light. But how many of you know that that light shines the best in the darkest places? God's word will illuminate your path no matter what you're going through. What we want is this. We want, uh, what, what can you buy now? Like 150 million lumen flashlight, you know what I'm talking about? Those big ones that you can bring planes down with, you know, they're just huge lights. We want lights like that, that light up our future, that light up our path and tell us the direction. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we're picturing this eternal, massive, mega, mag light, so to speak. But in those days, when it said your word is a lamp and a light, their lamp was literally a candle. And a candle only casts enough light for you to see what the next step or two is. That's about it. And that's what they were talking about. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, your word will illuminate my next step. And when will I know what the next step is? As soon as you take in that one step. Then it illuminates the next one. And you take another step. And it illuminates the next one. Have you ever been praying God, for God to answer a prayer? And it doesn't seem like he's answering, but it's simply not because he's not answering. It's probably because we're not moving. We're not taking that next step. Because as soon as you take the next step, he reveals what the next step is. And that can be a scary place to be, but that's what we call faith. That's all about faith. So God's word will illuminate our path. Are we good so far? We're doing good? Okay. Here's another thing that the Word of God, that we can expect from the Word of God. Number four, write down that it will release authority. It will release authority. I want you to know that as you leave this day, you have all the authority that you need to address anything and everything that you are going through. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay, ten of you believe it. How about the rest of you? Now let me, let me explain it a minute. Don't just say amen because, you know... I'm encouraging that. I want you to understand it. If you're here today and you have Jesus in your heart, you've asked him to forgive you of your sins. You said, I repent it. You don't have it figured out. You're not perfect. You don't have all the answers. He says, but because you have me, you have all the authority that you need to address anything you're going through. Are you here and you're facing addiction? Well, if I'm addicted, then I can't be a Christian, can I? Yeah, you can. You can be a Christian and have addictions and have all the authority you need to address that. You have that. You have all the authority you need that when the enemy comes in and you feel this darkness, this heaviness, to start to weigh in on you, you have all the authority you need to speak to that and tell it to move. We just sang about it. I believe. I'll see you do it again. See what? A moving of a mountain. Do you really believe that? Because that authority is inside of you. Is your family going bonkers and you don't know what to do and you're seeking the Lord? You have all the authority to start speaking peace in your home. You have all the authority to walk around. You can anoint your house. You can, you can speak that, that uh, grace and all of that. You've got all the authority that you need to do what it is that God is calling you to do. I think of, in the Bible, uh, a man named Paul. We all know Paul. In the New Testament, he, interesting guy. He was, he was um, persecuting uh, Christians, right? And then you find in Acts chapter 9, he, there's a conversion that takes place. And then in Acts 13, he has a name change. I found that very interesting. Paul, uh, Paul, Saul, who became Paul, he had an illuminating moment with God on that road to Damascus. And it turned his heart around. And here's what it says when he's heading for his missionary journey in Acts 26. He says, I am sending you off. Say that with me. I am sending you off. In other words, I'm releasing authority. I'm releasing authority in your life. I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. See the difference between Satan and God, and choose God. I'm sending you off. In other words, I'm releasing authority to present my offer of sin, sin's forgiveness uh, and, and a place in the family, inviting them to the company of those who be, begin uh, real living and believing in me. 
He's saying here in the scripture, I'm releasing authority in your life to go and do whatever it is I've called you to do. So the question is, is what has God called you to do? And whatever that is, you may have doubts, you may have worries, you may question some things, but he says, but I've released authority in your life. Why? Because he's trusting you. Why? Because you trusted him. You've invited him into that. So it doesn't matter if you're here today and, 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 and you're a new Christian or if you've been walking with the Lord for 50 years. The question is, is, are you walking with an understanding that you have all the authority you need to address anything that's going on in your life? Things are falling in on you. Things aren't working out the way you expect. But you have, I'm not talking about prosperity belief, okay? I'm not believing about blab it, grab it, and all that name it, claim it stuff. I'm talking about speaking the word of God in truth. And having faith, believing in God's word, that you can have that authority. And he releases that into your life. Matthew 28. It's, it's the great commission there where he says, I have all authority and I'm giving it to you. Now go. He says, I'm releasing authority into your life. So let me ask the question. What's God calling you to do? He's calling you to start a new business? Is he calling you to open up something fresh and new in your life? Forgive a husband? Uh, I, I don't know what it is. But what is it he's calling you to do? He's released that authority in your life. And if God has called you to do it, then he's given, he's given everything to, for you to accomplish it. And it's time that we started walking with an understanding of the anointing that we have on our life so that we can go back and take whatever it is the enemy is trying to steal from us. Amen? Amen? Hey, how many of you were there for praise and worship night last Sunday? They pulled out an oldie but a goodie. Um, I went to the enemy's camp. Remember that song? I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. You can only do that when you have the anointing of the Lord in your life and understand that you have all authority to go and to take that. But you've got to understand there's a difference. There's a difference between authority taken and authority that's been given. There's two different things there. To be given the, the authority means that you have been entrusted to function on God's behalf and that you have been given the opportunity to steward that authority that God has given to you. That's what it means to be given authority. Uh, but that's much different than, than taking authority. Some people just like to take. And when they take, what it means is this. Taking authority means uh, that they have said by their actions, I'm tired of waiting, therefore I'm taking action, and I'm taking authority. And I don't care what you think about it. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between being trusted and between becoming impatient and saying, I'm going to do it my way. There's a difference in that. And you've got to learn the difference between the two because that can be a very dangerous place. God releases. You can expect from the Word of God that He will release that authority in your life. Number five, write this down. What else can I expect from the Word of God? You can expect that He will restore your soul. You can expect that he will restore your soul. So number one, you can expect that he'll give you renewed life. Number two, that his word will reveal truth. Three, that it will illuminate your path. Four, that it releases authority in your life. And then you understand, number five, that he, the word of God, will restore your soul. Psalms 23 is a very familiar portion of scripture. Uh, and in the midst of that, it says that he restores our soul. How many of you have ever seen or maybe you've been involved in the restoration of a car? Anybody, how, how many car lovers do we have? Guys, if you like cars. Um, how many of you, you know, old cars? Yeah? Um, there's different cars. Model T. I asked my dad first service. I said, were you around when Model, Model Ts were around? He said, yes. And I said, that says something right there. But then I realized I know a lot of these old cars too. <laughs> Chevy Corvair. Uh, maybe, maybe your car is a 57 Chevy. I don't know. Um, mine was a 1969 Barracuda. I loved that car. Now, I had to learn to love this car, and, and I've got a point to this, but you know, many people, when they see old cars, here's what happens. Old cars after time start to rust, right? They break down, and, and, and all of a sudden, they become kind of worn out. So people will go and actually restore these cars. They will go and purchase these broken down, rusted out cars that won't work, won't move, and they will pay at their own cost money to take that heap on. Why? Because they want and they desire to restore it. That's what they want to do. And so they'll work on that. I am not a car restorer. You all know that by now. 
But but the, the car I love was my it was my grandma's car, to be honest with you. It was a 1969 Plymouth Barracuda, and it was pea green in color. That does not really go well for a 17-year-old guy in high school. Okay? You know, and uh, people knew it was grandma's car and they'd make fun of it until uh, I showed them what grandma's car could do. It could go zero to 35 miles an hour in a heartbeat, Dad. Yeah. Never went over 35. <laughs> but those cars, we take them and we restore them. And I thought about one of the things that we can expect from the Word of God is, is that maybe you're here today and you feel like life is kind of broken down right now. Things are rusted out. Some joy has leaked out and, 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 and I don't know what to do about it. I want you to know right now that you serve a God that wants to bring restoration into your life. The question is, is are you willing to submit to that process? He wants to restore you. He wants to take those areas that are broken down and rusted. And, and he say, the window doesn't crank up anymore. And he will take it and, and on his own dime because the price has already been paid. And he will restore your heart. He'll restore your life. He'll restore your marriage. He has the ability to do that. But we must be willing to surrender that to him. We must come to him and be willing to say, Lord, Help me in this area. What can I expect from the Word of God? You can expect that when you come to Him, He brings a restoration process to you. Number six, what can I expect from the Word of God? You can expect that He is going to revive your spirit. He is going to revive your spirit. Um, it's easy to become beaten down in this world. Have you found that out? Okay. Have you found that life can be difficult, challenging, stressful? Yeah, we, we, we don't have to look far. You, you don't have to look far. You can turn on the TV and see that. Uh, I, I don't like to watch the news much anymore. And, and please forgive me. If you've messaged me on Facebook and I've not responded, I'm not being rude. I, I try to stay off it as much as possible. I'm on it somewhat. But there's a reason for that. I don't get on that very much and I don't watch the news very much. Because when's the last time you turn on the news and their headline story was about the way that people were blessing other people? When's the last time you turned on the news and they said, this just in? Somebody decided to give everything to the homeless and the poor. And, you know, hey, that doesn't happen. Now, there's good news out there. I'm not saying there's not. But I'm saying usually when you turn your TV on, all you see is the discouraging. All you do is see is the negative and, and what's wrong. Now, there, there's two camps, and you've got to be careful. I'm not, here to, I'm, not, I'm not getting political or talking about news. But, I, you know, I, sometimes people say, yeah, we shouldn't watch news at all. And then there's other people that, that say, well, we've got to know the state of our our, our government. We've got to know the state of our you know, political leaders and what's going on in our community. And I, I agree with both. you just got to find a healthy balance. That's all. You've got to find a healthy balance. What's my point? My point is, is you don't have to look far to become discouraged. Not far at all. But what you must do and what you can expect from the Word of God is, is that in the midst of whatever discouragement you see, you can expect that He will revive your spirit. He will revive your spirit. And that makes all the difference in the world. And you, you, can't, you can't revive something, though, that's not been vibed, if I can say it that way. You can't revive something that you can't give life back to something that never had life. You know what I'm talking about? So it starts with the relationship with Jesus Christ. But maybe you've been walking with him, and, and it's got stale. It's got boring. It's got, I, I'm not connected. I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. Then expect and desire, if you desire to, to, to have your spirit revived, he says he will do that. It's kind of like, 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 like he wants to stir that flame inside of you once again. It brings that life back. It's kind of like, think of it like CPR. You can't, like, like I said, you can't revive something that isn't vibe. You can't revive someone until, first of all, they've lost their life. That, I mean, think of it. You can't give CPR to somebody who's alive, right? That's just weird. That's just, it's not going to end well. It's not going to go good. But when you feel like there's no life there, when there's just become a spiritual death, things are dormant and nothing's happening, Lord, where are you? You can expect that he is going to revive your spirit, but you've got to want that. You've got to want that, and you've got to ask for that. Maybe you're here today and you're going through loss. You're saying it's just been difficult. I don't know what to do. God can revive your spirit. And I could ask you today, do you believe that? The, the reality is, is no matter how loud you are or are not means nothing. Do you believe it? Maybe you're here today and, and you feel so lonely inside. You know what I'm talking about when you just feel that ache like it's just not, it's not the same and you're saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. I, revive within me. Revive my spirit once again. Do you believe he can do that? 
Because when you believe He can by faith, then He does do that. I'm not saying that you don't walk through difficult times. I'm not saying that you don't experience negative situations. All I'm simply saying is, is when you walk through them, He comes and holds your hand. If you're sitting on the couch and you feel de defeated, deflated, and miserable, He comes and He sits with you. Sometimes he may not show up the way you want him to. He may not kick in the door and doves come flying out of it while rays of sunshine spray through and angels are singing. And he says, you're right and everyone else is wrong. Because that's kind of the picture we paint in our head, isn't it? I mean, that's a, we'd all love that. We're honest with ourselves. Sometimes in the middle of your mess or in the middle of your pain or in the middle of whatever it is you're going through, he just comes and he sits with you. And he revives your spirit. He revives your spirit. His word says this. Psalm 119. This is my comfort in my affliction. That your word has what? Revived. Revived. <clears throat> that your word has revived. It's in these times that we can find that when we face affliction, his word will revive us. And lastly is this. What can I expect from the word of God? You can write this one down, number seven. You can expect that he never changes. He never changes. He never, 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 ever changes. We, we change our minds all the time. We say, right, right now you might be thinking, I'm doing Taco Bell for lunch, but by the time you get out of this place, you may be doing Yen Chings. You don't know. Your minds are always changing. Jesus never changes his mind. And I'm not talking about lunch. I'm talking about you and me. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and for." Ever, forever. He says he will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. He says that he's already given you the victory. That you are the head and you're not the tail. He says that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. But how many of you feel as if you're walking in that purpose? You feel that spiritual renewal taking place. You feel that joy in your life. By the way, joy is a choice. Did you know that? Are you choosing joy today? Happiness, there's a difference between the two. Most of us, when we say, I want the joy of the Lord, what we mean is, is I want to be happy. And happiness comes as a result of circumstances in your life. I'm happy because you gave me a million dollars. I'm happy because you gave me a car. I'm happy because you bought my lunch. You see, I'm happy because you did something for me. But what about when nobody does anything for you? Are you still experiencing the joy of the Lord? Because the word of the Lord says, the joy of the Lord is your what? Yeah, and mo most of us here, we want strength. We want to be stronger. But we just don't want to choose joy. Why? Because then nobody's giving me something. We may have to refocus. What can you expect from the Word of God? You can expect renewed life. You can expect the truth. Illumination of your path. Authority being released in your life. You can expect restoration. You can expect Him to revive your spirit. And you can expect and take it to the bank that He will never, ever change. He will not change. He is the same God that loved you then. He's the same God that loves you now. You know, I decided first service, it's somewhere between first service, between singing the songs about victory and hearing, hear, I don't know how to explain it. Sometimes when I preach, half my brain's talking, the other half's listening, okay? So I'm even learning why I'm up here, okay? And I, I decided I'm going to believe what that preacher was preaching because when we got to the point about releasing authority, I realized in myself, this is just me personally, okay? The Lord spoke to me and said, Jim, you haven't been stepping out in the authority that I've assigned to you. Now, don't get me wrong. He didn't say I haven't been at all. But what he was saying is you can step a little bit more. There's authority I've released in your life. Why don't you step out in that and walk in that and see what I'll do? I, that, that's what he spoke to me. My question to you today is, is, what, is what did he speak to you? What do you speak to you? Because, because I don't want you to come to church and just feel good. I want you to come to church and hear truth and go home and be able to apply it into your life. Because if you can't do that, nothing changes. We feel stuck. We feel like this is the same old life. We're, we're praying for renewal. We're praying for a reviving in our spirits. And we know that God never changes, but it seems like nothing else ever does everywhere else. Also, Nothing is going to change until you and I are bold enough to take that step. Do you remember the movie Indiana Jones? The Last Crusade. Last Crusade, that'd be the third one. This is where Indiana Jones goes over to the, uh, you know, to the Nazis in Germany, and he's after a book. He's after this one particular book that his dad had, remember? His dad mailed it to him. He brought it here, and he said, my son wouldn't be stupid enough to bring that over here, but he was stupid enough to bring it. 
And they're looking for the book. Why? Because there were some key elements in that book. There were some pictures and diagrams and drawings in that book that told a story that could, could affect the, the, the outcome of the whole world that basically that was going on. And so they literally went into the lion's den, into, into Germany, so they could find that particular book and rescue that. Why? Because they knew there was such power in it. And that was a book that had to do with history. And that was something that was done in a movie in Hollywood. And we can remember that story, but sometimes we forget about the truth of this one. This book right here is not just a book that sells at Zondervan's or that you can get on Amazon.com. This is the living word of God that's ready to breathe life into your very spirit and revive you. The question is, is are you ready? Are you ready to receive what the Holy Spirit has for you? You see, may we understand the lessons from many leaders who have gone down these paths that we've gone down. Do you know how many leaders are in here? that have screwed up like you screwed up, who have succeeded like you succeeded, who have had impure thoughts like you've had impure thoughts, who have had addiction problems like you've had addiction problems, who have experienced loss of loved ones, people who have lost their husband, people who have lost their wife, people who have lost their children, people who have had people betray them, stab them in the back, leave them, forsake them. He, he's got something to say about all of it. And he wants to reveal it to you and me. So my prayer is simply this. If this book doesn't any longer become just some kind of a book, this is your lifeline. This is your lifeline. This is the, the word of the Lord. When it's a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. My question is, what's the next step that God's illuminating for you? You don't have to tell me. Just what is it? And then the next question is, when are you going to take the next step? When are you going to take that next step? What can I expect from the word of God? Life, truth, illumination, authority, restoration, spiritual re revival, and a God that never changes. I want to pray today for all of us. As I said, we came to the end of the year 2019. I don't think it's irony that we go into a year that's 2020. I, I pray that for each and every one of us. That when we ask ourselves the question, what can we expect from the Word of God, that there's already something that's happening, something the Lord's speaking to you for next year that brings a 2020 spiritual vision to your life. So I want to ask, would you just bow your head with me and close your eyes? As I pray and say, Jesus, will you come right now and reveal to us, Lord, unleash within us the power of your Holy Spirit that speaks truth in such a magnificent way that we may know that we know that we've heard you. Lord, I pray for each and every person that's here today and that, Lord, they may look back upon their year and say this year has been a year that's been difficult, it's been tough. Maybe this year, this moment, you're feeling that sense of loss. Maybe there's this overwhelming sensation of loneliness and you feel like, like nobody else gets it or understands and though nobody else may or may not, God understands every moment. His Holy Spirit sees right where you're at. And he wants to unleash and reveal something into your life that you've never experienced before. So, Father, I pray that you will come and deposit within our hearts and our lives truth. Lord, I pray that you deposit your love, your mercy, your grace, so that, Lord God, we wouldn't have just come to church and had some kind of a service, but that, Lord, we can leave here and be the church that you called us to be. So, Lord, it doesn't matter how much we grow, how little we grow. It doesn't matter as success determined on, on human terms. What matters is, Lord, did we please you. Did we bring glory and honor to your name? Because nothing else matters. So Father, I pray that you take all that we have and all that we are. Lord, as we surrender that to you, Jesus, will you re as, as you redeem us continually, Lord, we also ask that you restore us continually. That you develop us. That we may be all that you called us to be in Jesus' name. Amen, church.